Bible says in Matthew 24:14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. India beckon. I from injustice to indomitable by Christ. And from narrow-minded to nurturing milk from Christ. D from dissolution to a decisive decision for Christ. I from idleness to independence through Christ. A from abject poverty to affluent possessions in Christ. As GCK this November offers you full redemption through Christ. From India to the world, bringing salvation, solution, and liberty through Christ for all. Every yoke it will break. All the shackles it will shatter in Jesus' name. November 23, 228, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily. Full redemption through Christ for everyone, everywhere. Ministers, church workers, and professionals will gain speed as they will receive the great fundamentals of ministry in three special days November 24, 27, and 28. And on Saturday, young people all over the world will be elevated at Impact Academy. It will be the divine creation of heroes from zero. You follow, you go. As I grow, you follow. You grow as I glow. You follow, you glow in Jesus' name. A life-changing experience awaits you at full redemption through Christ. Live at GCK locations across the globe. And live their satellite and all our social media platforms. The man of God, anointed international evangelist and convener of the GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumi will minister Christ with power. Along with other ministers from India. This is GCK. It is the gospel to every creature. Our Father, we do thank you for another session. Thank you, Lord, for what we've learned. We're praying, O oh Lord, that today you speak to every heart once again in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the excitement and the joy of serving you will keep us on, moving on, anywhere you have sent us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that whatever it is in us that is recoiling, that is reversing, that is trying to say, why should I go here? Why should I go there? All those things that are negative to absolute surrender and total consecration unto you, Lord, we pray you scrape from our lives in Jesus' name. And it tends to have sympathizers. Why am I there? Why am I there? Why am I here? Oh Lord, I pray those tendencies to take away from our lives in Jesus' name. Anywhere you need us, anywhere you want us, anywhere you've sent us, we will go and we will do your work without looking back in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you impact our lives once again. Open our eyes to see great, wonderful things out of your word. And we pray, Lord, we'll never turn back. We'll keep on moving until we do everything you've called us to do in Jesus name. Bless us once again Lord and make us channels of blessings unto all the people you send us to. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus name we pray. An excited amen. amen. Thank you very much. You can see and we're looking at our passage here for this time. You know the passage by now. What's the passage now? Second Kings chapter 6, we're looking at it from verse 1. In Second Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And the sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight or too narrow or too confined or too small for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there and where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye, 
and once and once said be content i pray thee and go with thy servants and he answered i will go in verse 4 so he went with them and when they came to jordan they cut down the wood but as one was felling a beam the axe head fell into the water and he cried and said alas master for it was borrowed and the man of god said where fell it and he showed him the place and he caught down his stick and cast it in thither and the iron did swim our iron will swim the impossible will become possible. And the things that had never happened in ministry before, if you look at all the men, all the men of God that came before Elisha, this never happened. You know, there are people that never think they can see any, old, any new thing. You know, the Red Sea have been parted already, and then man had come for, from heaven for all those 40 years, and a lot of things have happened. So, what else are we going to see? Here is something that is happening for the first time that never happened before. And so, when you go, and you're ministering, and you have a new challenge, and you have a new mountain, and you say, this never happened before, and I know the respect we have for our leadership, we say, uh, for the uh, GS and for our father in the Lord, even in his life, in his ministry, this never happened before. So, what can I expect? Elisha could have said that to you that when the iron fell into the river, then he could have said, What can I do? There's nothing. If you look at Moses or look at Joshua or look at Elijah, my own mentor and master, that never happened. So, what am I going to do? There is something you can do. God can start with you and do something new that was never done done before. That's why we're coming back to this now. I'm going to talk to you on becoming an NLP. Becoming an NLP. NLP means no limit preacher. No limit preacher. A person that has no limit. A person that he moves on and on and then he has formed the secret of being an NLP, a no limit preacher, a no limit prophet, a no limit pastor. That there's no limit at all. We talk of moving mountains, we talk of stopping the sun, we talk of, talk of stopping the moon, and we talk of many, many things that other people did. And they did it for the first time. It was never done before. How did they become people like that? You're going to find one word that is repeated over over and over in this passage. Let's come to verse 2, for example. Let us go. That's a little word there, go. And then it says in the latter part of that verse, and he answered, go ye. And then it also says, be content, I pray, I pray thee to go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. Well, you see that word over and over and over again. That let us go. And then go with us. And then he says, I will go. You begin to think about the thing that happened in this chapter here. That if Elisha had not gone with them, this miracle he would never have seen in his life. And this is the only place, the, a miracle like this is recorded in the Bible. Which means that the kingdom of God is going to miss something. Because Elisha did not go with them. It is in the going. That you're going to discover things you have never seen. It is when you go to a difficult place, you go to a place you you know where you have some challenges. It is the going there that brings some miracles that you have never never seen in your life. And that's uh, one thing or about becoming an NLP, becoming a no limit preacher, no limit prophet, no limit pastor. I'm going to divide this uh, passage now into three parts. Number one, the willingness to go. The willingness to go. Number two, watchfulness while we go. And then number three, wonders only as we go. Number one is willingness to go. Now, there wasn't any compulsion or pressure on Elisha. He could have said, you are the sons of the prophets. You are the trainees. I am the trainer. I am the master. I am the one training you. And you said you want to go. That initiative came from you. You said you wanted to expand where we're dwelling. Go ahead and do it. And don't bring me in. Because uh, this is not a uh, part of what I wanted to do. But you see, Elisha, he says that this is the thing to do. And he said, I will go. The willingness to go. That's where spectacular things begin. And that's where some things have never 
never seen before. That's where it begins. When you say, I'm going to overlook whatever hindrance or whatever challenges, and I will go. Number one, the willingness to go. But then watchfulness while we go. And while they were over, the, now they have gone. They have done well. And then they were caught the beam. Why didn't they check up that axe? To know that the axe said is well fitted to the um, to the wood. But they didn't do that. That's the thing we need to do. We need to watch what we're using. And the see you have, you know, when we talk about the axe said, it just for them it was the axe said. For Moses, it was the rod. And you're, you're going to find that all the life of Moses, can you think of a man that kept a rod for 40 years and never misplaced it? I never lost it because he was watching. He knew that this is my own accent. This rod in my hand. You find him by the mountain to strike the rock. The rod was there. And you find him by the Red Sea. The rod was there. Anywhere you find Moses, the rod of God was in his hand. He never lost it. He never misplaced it because he knew this is a secret of my walking the miracles. And you find a person, for example, like David, he had a sling and a stone. And that thing was always with him. There was the watchfulness that for them, for that son of the prophet, it was there said but for me it is a sling and the stone that i have and he was the father sent him the father did not tell him that now you are going make sure you take your sling and your stone i don't know what i'm going to meet there go and see your brothers yes daddy i'm going to go and see my brothers and take this to them and he took all those things and then he took a sling and a stone he didn't know he was going to fight but it must always be with me the, the watchfulness that you know that this is the secret of what the lord has given me the job bone of the ass in the hand of Samson. In his own case, uh, after he had done what he did, he just threw it away and then he became thirsty. And he said, I'm going to die now. And we say Samson, what, what is your own accent? Because your accent is that thing that you have where that miracle had been done. Keep that thing. Hold that thing. There are some people that once that thing is done, they just, you know, throw the job bone of the ass away. But you, can, you should keep it. And that's the reason we're looking at while we are going, the watchfulness we ought to have so that this accent we have and the thing we're using we don't lose it. And then number three, not wonders only as we go. Only as we go. And you're going to find a lot of people in the Bible only as they wage. That's when the wonders happen. You know, some people, they see it in their, you know, location and all this uh, church planting were doing, I would say, you know, done discipling a whole nation and plant a church there and plant a church there. Or they say, you know, all this, this is enough for us. You know, the, the miracles you are going to see will be very much limited once you stay in the same location, the same congregation every time, the same set of people every time you know all of them and you know their challenges and you know what what they are in fact even if they are blind eyes or they have a lameness or whatever they're used to that and they, you're, you've been with them for about five years or seven years and they're used to you know you they come into you and you reaching out to them and they not expect anything to happen it is when you leave that little congregation that is confined there and then you go here and go there and go there that's how wonders happen that's how the signs and the wonders will come wonders only as we go let's come to number one what's number one again the willingness to go let's look at uh, for a second uh, second kings chapter six and i'm reading there from verses two and three let us go we pray thee unto jordan and take this every man a beam and let us make us a place there where we may dwell and he answered go ye and one of them once said be content i pray thee and go with thy servants and he answered i will go say i will go they never knew what they were going to meet when he said i will go and all the others all the students because this actually a college and this actually the college of the sons of the prophets where they were being trained all of them all those students said we're going together and they all went and they went with elisha and elisha went with them and would you notice that all the people that the lord sent and he called them there was that willingness to go and it was because of that willingness actually some great great things happened in their lives we're looking at him Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go 
when he was called to go out, out into a place, into a place which he should, after receive an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out. He was called to go out. He didn't know where he was going, but the call was there. He didn't know what the people would look like, what the places would look like, and all those things, but he went. And he says he went out not knowing whither he went. All the miracles that happened in his life, all the power of intercession that happened in his life, and everything that he did after that came as a result of that first step of going. He went out not knowing whether he weighed. And that's the faith there. Faith has a level of risk. But it is no risk really. But you see people, they say, what a risk that is. That I'm going to a place, I don't even have something to read about them. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what the people look like. I don't know whether they are friendly or they are hostile. And then the Lord is saying, go. How can I go in that condition? That is the point of faith. And remember, we're talking about becoming a no limit person. A no limit preacher. The reason and the the way we can only become somebody that would not be limited or the power of God in our lives is that we're able to reach out to the places that we reach out to. And then we're looking at Exodus now, chapter 4. We've seen Abraham. Let's look at Moses, Abraham, and now Moses, the next person in Exodus chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 12. Exodus chapter 4, verse 12. Now, therefore, go. Now, therefore, go. I'm sure you know that Moses had challenges that, you know, many of us do not have. You remember that while he was going in this same, this same chapter 4, that a God wanted to kill the second son that had not been circumcised. And then very quickly, the wife, because the wife was from, you know, the, from Jethro and was not an Israelite and did not understand the circumcision. And they had been talking about that, arguing about that, and talking about that, and that woman said, you will not circumcise the child. When you circumcise the first child, at the mess and the blood, what kind of bloody religion is that? I'm not going to allow that. And eventually, as was going on, the Lord wanted to kill that child because an uncircumcised child will not be in the midst of the children of Israel. Very quickly, then the wife took a sharp stone and then cut off the first skin of that uh, boy. And as a bloody husband, you are. And threw, threw that uh, first skin at his feet. Now, you understand, in a family like that, that the husband, the wife will not understand. Go. Where are you going? What are you doing? But in spite of not understanding, the Lord had called Moses. And you think about if that wife had had the preeminence over the husband. Think about the whole, the deliverance of the whole nation. That's the reason why we're talking about that while we have the calling and while the Lord is saying this is what you do, the willingness from your own heart to go. You, you see there are some people that will uh, just disqualify a man like that and you see that you know go this way and say say pastor i want to go but my wife is not uh, yielding to this and we say go ahead it's you god has called the lord is not calling your wife your wife is part of you but the call is actually coming to you and even though zipporah did not understand the lord just said this is what you do and thank god he did it I said, thank God he did it. And I, I want to, you know, we need to not read the Bible afresh and understand what the Bible says. You know, sometimes you go like that. Your wife is so happy to go with you. That's wonderful. But do you know that at this point, Zipporah was sent back? Because that's why in chapter 18, the Jethro now brought the wife and the two sons to come to to him so that now they can go ahead because i've heard that the lord is doing great things with you the point is when the lord has called you it's you he called look at all the people in the bible look at abraham god called abraham thank god sarah followed and look at this man moses now thank god eventually zipporah joined on and then you look at david he had a wife too but you know, he went to all those battlefields on his own and he did what he ought to do and that's what the lord is bringing to and then in fact when you look at peter peter was my once in a while he went with his wife to do this and to do that but when he went to the prison he went there alone and think about barnabas and think about saul and about paul he went they went alone that's why you need to understand the call of god is upon your life and this is not the day to say well i would only do this is so and so agrees who is that person that is greater than God in your life and greater than Christ in your life? Over here, I'm coming to verse 12. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Amen. 
I said, Amen. He said, now go, I have the covenant with you. I'm calling you. I'm giving you the commission. You are the one I'm saying, go. I about my wife, go and tell her. I will not tell her anything, but go and tell her yourself. If she agrees to go with you, that will be wonderful. If she doesn't agree, go in any case and do what I've called you to do. You will do it in Jesus' name. And look at the result in the life of, uh, in the life of Moses. I'm looking at Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, I'm reading from verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses whom the Lord knew face to face because he went. What if he did not go? I'm a stammered Lord. I cannot do this Lord. I do not have the ability and experience and the way with thou to do this Lord and then but he went. He went and because he went that's why he became what he became. It says there was nobody like Moses in all the among all the children of Israel that knew the Lord face to face in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and in all the great uh, mighty hand in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel and the secret is in the going I pray you will go when you think about all the miracles that happened in the ministry of Moses, it was based on the fact that God called him. And he said, yes, Lord. And then eventually he went. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Tell me the rest send me. Here am I. Send me. As you look at all the great revelations that Isa received, and then he said, I and the children whom the Lord has given me were for signs and wonders in Israel. It was because he responded appropriately. It was because he was willing to go. And he said, here am I. Send me. It is that willingness to yield to the call of the Lord. And we're not, you know, sitting back and we're not uh, kind of thinking it over in the camp of Reuben, you know, rumination and thinking over, will he do it, will he not do it? Why is it that Reuben is staying with the sheep and is hearing the bleating of the sheep? Why doesn't he rise up immediately? and go. It is this going, willingness to go that made us to have all this revelation that he had. And then in verse 9 and he said, go and tell that people and tell these people, hear ye indeed and understand and understand not and see ye indeed but perceive not. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 7. Jeremiah 1 7, but the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt, what's the next word there? Thou shalt go, I will go. I said, I will go. And thou shalt go to all the to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, tell me the rest. Thou shalt go. You see some of the things, uh, you know, that are happening now. We, we talk about Ukraine and we talk about, you know, many of these other places. It's, it's the way God, you know, has said go. Otherwise, those things will not be happening. I remember when, uh, you know, uh, before I even left Nigeria that, um, you know, I had a letter from uh, that side, indication that I was going to Ukraine. I spoke to the church secretary and I said, hey, look at this. I'm hearing about this, this, this over there. And I don't think I need to go to a place like this. If he remembers, he remembers that we discussed uh, you know, at the IBTC here. And then eventually I went there and they sent a letter again and they said, uh, you know, come to Ukraine. And I said, Ukraine? I, I said, no, I'm not coming because to get a visa to get there, you have to go this way and go this way go, and go this way. And eventually the pastor there called me and he said, please, uh, uh, you are my father in the Lord. Well, which if we want to, I said, I cannot come because you have to go through this, this and this. That's what your secretary wrote to me. And, and he said, oh, we're sorry. It's because they don't understand English very well. That's why they wrote a, a kind of letter like that. But that everything is simple. You just go here and then over there. And then they'll give you this period of time to come for the visa. I said, okay, I'll try. And eventually I went to the uh, visa office or embassy in uh, London here. And when I got there, I got there on Friday. And then they said, I should come and collect it on Monday. And then I collected like that. And then we went there. And when we went there, some things happened. 
Babylon. And then we get to another city. Now, without going, all those things will not have happened. And thank God I went, and thank God you are going to go. I said you are going to go. And as a man that, uh, you know, was uh, at the last stage of cancer, they just uh, left him, let him to die. And uh, while they let him to die, they carried him. It, that was the first time I saw Mark chapter 2. Like this in front of me, they put the man, on a, not on a stretcher, but in a blanket. One man here, one man here, one man here, one man here. Four of them carrying the man, and they brought the man. It's like they are carrying a, a slain animal. And then they brought him there. And when you saw all bones, all the flesh, almost totally gone. And then you see that, and I spoke to the people there on the faith that works. And then after that, you couldn't just, you know, pray like I normally pray generally for everybody, you know, uh, you are there, receive your miracle. The man was about dying, receive your miracle. What does he understand by that? I had to go there and lay hands on him and pray for him. And when I did that, he began, he said, the air he was breathing now is different. It's breathing fresh air. It was still like a skeleton. And then they pulled, they still got him up like, uh, you know, that uh, uh, four people at the edges. And then he got out. The following day, he got up from his bed by himself to go to the bathroom. And then the following week, he went to repair a car for, you know, with uh, some people. And then right now, he's born again. Right now, he's baptized in water. And right, he's gone to the hospital now. And then they say they could not see a trace of cancer. And if you understand that, you know, cancer is a deadly, terrible thing. And when that has happened, and then you now look back and say, if you didn't go that place, what would have happened? And when we went there in April, they called this preacher, this preacher, this preacher. One of the preachers they called had been going there for more than 10 years. And it's almost like the patron to them in that church. I was going there for the first time. And all the other people, they preach, and then, you know, every one of us, the three of us, we had one message every day. On the fight when they were giving testimony, they didn't give testimony on the messages of this person on this person, only the messages God allowed me to pass across. They gave messages, and then the people then said, I should, uh, you know, please come back in April, in May. I said, Come back in May. I had only one way visa to go there, that is only one single entry. And then I came back and they said, uh, Well, they'll write a letter. And when they write th those letters, you don't understand the language, everything is just like you know, if you understand Russian or if you look at all the scripts it's not like this our own alphabet you can't read anything there and then i took it there uh, to the you know they had written multiple bits and everything and i got it there and they used to tell me that you'll wait for these many weeks and when i got there the person looks at looked at me and said when do you want to have the visa and when he said when, it's like, you know, Moses asking Pharaoh, when do you want uh, the, uh, the frogs to go away? And then the Moses, uh, you know, Pharaoh said, uh, you remember? He said tomorrow. And I looked at him because he said that it takes this many weeks. And uh, while I was looking at him, he said, do you want to have it today? I said, as I said, he said, we're going to close at uh, 1230. You know, it was about after nine. You can come back, uh, you know, before 1230 and have the visa. And then we got there about 12 so that they would not have locked their door and say, come back another time. Immediately he saw me like this. He left everybody. And it's a place they don't, they don't want preachers. They were communists before. He just said, ah, come, come, come. And then he had stamped everything and he gave it back to me just the same day and i knew that this is god and then we went back there and all the people the apostolic council the regional council the spiritual council they brought everybody together and for me to train them they brought all their workers together all the members of the church together that's why you'll find uh, some of the congregations are small some of them are large and then the large church there and every time i preach they will come and ask me uh, one of the interpreters will say how did you know the things you are seen that you are talking about that person, you are talking about that person, you are talking about that person. And then when it comes to their pastor, when they, they asked me a particular question, and then I went through quite a lot of things, that's why they said, you are talking about our pastor. Now we know that, we know where the apple is coming from. You are the apple tree, and this is one of your apple fruits. You see, and this kind of thing, all that kind of revelation that you just say things, you've never been there, and then they take me to different, different branches, and 
then when they took me to a particular branch, in that branch, I've never been in that branch, and then I chose uh, the topic that I wanted to talk about, and I spoke from beginning to the end, and then the interpreter, he was not the pastor because it's another church, another branch, it was, uh, she was telling me later and said, how is it that you chose that topic? Because this particular branch church, this is their peculiar situation, and this is the problem they have. How would I experience that without going? The point is, if you want to become a no-limit preacher, go. And when you go, something will happen. And from there now, other people that are watching their internet or whatever, uh, they are calling from here, calling from... The other one you saw this uh, other time was I was speaking on righteousness and grace. You remember, in that church, there are 40 nationalities there. Not just the whites and blacks or so, because you won't recognize them. Forty nationalities there. And he called me to come and speak just for a moment. And then just for that one message. And then I gave the message. After that, all the leadership, they came together. They said, please, I don't go yet. After the service, I didn't know what they were going to do. Then they brought me into their leadership. And they discussed their constitution, their mission, their vision. And they said, it is, it is not right to just invite you to come and preach. We want you to look at our constitution, our mission, everything. I will want you now to come and lead us and direct us. I want you to be part of the leadership here so that you will show us this is what you and when you have a church of 40 nationalities and you have all those people there, and you if you want to reach all those various nations, they are there and they are saying that we're open. Come and show us how we what we're going to do to reach those nations. What if I didn't go? What if I said, Well, I have a lot of things waiting for me in Nigeria. Of course, a lot of things are here waiting for me. But the sin come. The sin come. And by the grace of God, we're going. And when we go like that, that is how you become a no limit preacher. Limits will be taken off your ministry. Then you'll be able to say, by the grace of God, this is the calling of God upon my life, and this is what I'm doing, and you're going to do it successfully in Jesus' name. But the point is go. Everybody say Go. You know, be sympathizing with your friend. And then the GS uh, called me. I saw you talking to the GS. What did he say again? <laughs> you know what he was saying now? <laughs> Tell me, what did he say? <laughs> Tell me. How do you know? <laughs> Praise the Lord. He told you that again. He's not even considering. Am I going to? I'm not even considering myself. I'm going, and because I'm going, you know, that's why I said, uh, you know, to the person in the afternoon, say, Baba, what you say, Baba, it means sit down. <laughs> you understand? I say, I'm not Baba, I'm GS. That's guided shepherd. I said, guided shepherd. GS is what? Guide a shepherd. You know, the Lord guide you to say, go here and go there and go. There. Because when that spirit is come, it will guide you into all truth and guide you into all places. And when you are just like that, you are being guided. This is where to go. You're not sitting back and saying that you are old. You are not old. And, you know, I was uh, talking to somebody. And while I was talking, I said, you know, as um, I don't normally say that, but I don't know what happened that day. And I said, you know, as a person is getting older, the person caught him. I said, no, sir, you're not getting older. I said, well, I withdraw those words. You know, because, uh, you know, he told me what well, you see. I have, uh, in fact, some people prayed for me um, last month when I, you know, 6th of June when I became 70. And he said, now this is the middle point, another 70 years. I said, if that is your faith, be it unto, be it unto us according to our faith in Jesus. And the point is, I'm going, you are going, where are going, and we will do it in Jesus' name. Look at this, verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not that I am a child, where my evil Say, say not, I am an old man. The same thing. Say not, I'm young. Say not, I'm old. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I shall command thee, that thou shalt speak. We're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. I'm reading there from verse 5. Acts chapter 8. And we're looking at verse 5. Acts 8. Reading from verse 5. It says, and... Philip went down 
to the city of Samaria and preach Christ unto them. What if he just remained there in Jerusalem? It was one of the seven. It was doing some good work there in chapter in chapter six when he chose them to distribute food. But now the call came when persecutions scattered them all abroad. And it says, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for the unclean for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many that were taken with pulses that and that were lame were healed and there was great joy in that city through you there will be great joy in every city but I want you to notice something now look at verse 25 and they referring to John and Peter Peter and John when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord Return to Jerusalem and preach the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. Arise and go. Uh, can you think about this now that there was a great revival in Samaria? And Peter and John came to help. Peter and John, in verse 25, just returned home. They returned to Jerusalem. And Philip was the only one there now. And then the Spirit of God said, Arise and go. We could argue about that. How would I arise and go? Who is going to lead the people? A great revival, a mighty revival, a whole city that turned to the Lord, and they're all new converts. How can I place a new convert? The people from Jerusalem, they have not sent anybody to replace me. And the people that came, they had gone. And the angel of the Lord said, Arise and go. We don't argue with the Lord. We don't say, This looks un unreasonable. This looks, you know, you have to plan and you have to make a chance for these people to grow. How, what do we put there now? But it says, Arise and go. And then we're told, she says, Toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and he went. Arise and go, and he arose, and he went. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, an Enoch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, and was returning and sitting in his chariot, and read Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit of the and the spirit said unto him, Go near. You see what the Spirit is saying and how he was directing Philip. If Philip had consulted with people, should I go, should I leave Samaria at this time? Who are you putting there? That cannot be the voice of the Lord. Anybody leading you to leave uh, this Samaria and then go to that desert place, why don't you just tell them that, okay, if it is like that, if he, the leader is so insistent that I must leave Samaria now, God understands, I cannot leave these people. They're my own babies. They're my own children in the faith. I will not leave them. And if it means that I'm going to leave the ministry, I'll leave the ministry and stay with these people. And if you talk to any of your friends about that, you'll say that's justified because if the man doesn't understand, he's not putting a replacement there. He's telling you to put some of, one of those new converts there and then for you to go to that place and there's no congregation there. Everybody will know that this is not right. Therefore, if you take any step, you will be right. And you are not right because the angel said, go. And the spirit of the Lord said, join yourself unto this chariot. And Philip ran thither unto him and had him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Well, you know the story, but look at verse 39. And when they were come out of the water, can you read the rest with me? Won't you go? The spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. I want you to think about your Bible now. Can you find any other person in the New Testament that had a miracle like this? That he was in this place and without aeroplane, without a motor car, without any means of transportation, the spirit of the Lord took him. He was not an apostle. It was not, uh, you know, somebody that, you know, will say he had a great ministry, miracle ministry. And this spectacular miracle, 
that the, even Paul the apostle he had to go on sea he had to go on the ship and then the storm and the waves and everything and they almost lost their lives and the spirit of the Lord never caught Paul the apostle to go from this place to that place even when he was being stoned to death even when they had to take him in the basket and get him over a wall the spirit of not take him like that but in the case of this Philip just because he went the point is if he had not gone if he did not obey the lord and the spirit of the lord to say go this miracle spectacular thing that never happened to any other person would not have happened unto him that's why we're saying for you to become a no limit pastor a no limit prophet a no limit preacher when the lord says go that is the thing to do and that is what brings some spectacular things to your life that you have never seen if you believe you'll say the glory of god God. And if you accept that and say, now I understand, now I see, I've been wondering, why am I so limited? Why is it this never happened, this never happened, and I've been praying and praying and fasting that this will happen. The secret is to become a no limit preacher, a no limit pastor, when the Lord says go, and we know he's saying go, then we go, and you'll see what you have never seen in Jesus' name. I'm looking at um, Acts chapter 10, I read from verse 19, Acts chapter 10, verse 19. While well, Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Therefore, get thee down and go. Go with them. Therefore, get thee down and go. That's the word again. The Lord was talking to Peter here and he was saying, All those reservations you have, all those things you are saying, I've never done this in my life. I've never eaten this in my life. I've never gone to these common people. I've never gone to these Gentiles before. And I'm not about to do that anymore. I'm not about to do that in my life. And the Lord is saying, What God has cleansed, do not call that common, unclean. Still go, doubting nothing. And then because he says, I've sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him, uh, unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And then we look at verse 28 there. In verse 28 it says, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful, it's an unlawful sin for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto to one unto another of another nation he said what i'm doing now i have never done and you know it's unlawful the jewish people will count this almost obscene how could you do this in verse 29 therefore came i unto you because of what the lord had told me without gain saying as soon as i was sent for i asked therefore for what intent ye have sent for me look at verse 44 while peter was yet while peter yet spoke speak these words the holy ghost fell on all them that heard the word and check up again in your bible that never happened any other time that it not it didn't lay hands on them he didn't direct them out to have the Holy Ghost. He was just speaking. He was even speaking about salvation. And while he was yet talking about salvation, how to be born again, how to have peace through Christ, because he is the one that the Father had sent, the Holy Ghost fell on them, and they all prophesied, every one of them without exception. And he never saw this kind of miracle in any other place except in this place. And it's in the going that will become somebody like that, that what you've never seen in any area of your ministry see those things will begin to happen in jesus name in a chapter 11 look at chapter 11 from verse 1 and the apostles and the brethren that were in judah heard that the gentiles had also received the word of god and when peter was come up to jerusalem they that were of the circumcision contended with him obviously if he had consulted them before going they would not have allowed him to go he said, no, there's no way you can do it. It's going to show you a bad example. You are the leading apostle. And you are going to the Gentiles. How can you, you, you know you cannot do that. If he had consulted with them, we don't consult with flesh and blood. There are sometimes some good, good people. These people were saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. But if he had talked to them, they would say, no, you cannot do that. And sometimes there are some good people in our lives, some good, you know, our wives are good people. That's how you marry them. If they were not good, how would you not marry? how would you marry them but we must understand that our wives do not have the holy spirit 
as the author even we ourselves we don't have the holy spirit like we ought to have and sometimes we need to emphasize this because once you want to do something and your wife says my husband no you take that as the voice of the lord sometimes they are right sometimes they are wrong sometimes you are right and sometimes you are wrong and that's why i would say we don't worship our wives do we worship our wives should we worship our wives of course no you don't get to the point where you say my wife i'm promising you anything you say no to anything whatever take my word anything you say no to i will never never do it and then your wife holds on to that and then something comes and god has a way of showing you that you said something wrong. You know, maybe at a careless moment, love. You know, this kind of love is uh, sometimes tricky. That you just love to the point that it, and, and nothing warrants that for you to say something like that. And then you call your wife and say, you know, my wife, I'm promising you that, you know, I love you so much that there's nothing I want to do that I'll not check off from you. Ah, that's a great mistake. Don't you say that. Because the Holy Ghost can tell you to do this and do this and go here and go there. And she will not understand. I know they are saved. I know they are sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. The people here, they were saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And yet, they contended with Peter. And that's why by the grace of God, I free myself. You know, I'm married now. And you know, I told them, my wife, I said, you know, I knew the Lord all these many years ago, and there were some decisions I took, some consecrations I made, and some things I opened my mouth to the Lord so many years ago, and I said, this is it, and there's nothing about to change that. I can be loving, of course, I ought to be loving, but Christ and the ministry and the mission he has called us to takes the first place and priority, and it must be like that for everybody. And to be like that for you in Jesus' name. And look at verse uh, 3. It says, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did ease with them. How could you do that? And then we're reading verse 12. And the Spirit bid me go with them, doubting nothing. The Spirit bid me go with them, doubting nothing. That's the secret. If you're going to be a no-limit person, you have to come to that point to say, the Spirit said so. The Spirit sent me, and the Spirit bade me go with them, doubting nothing. There must be that willingness to go. I pray you'll have it in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number two, watchfulness, while we go. I'm coming back to Second Kings, Second Kings chapter 6, watchfulness, while we go. In Second Kings chapter 6, I'm reading from verse, 4, from, from verse 5. So, he went with them. That's Elisha going with those sons of the prophets. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe said, fell into the water. And he cried and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. Alas, what am I going to do? Because it was borrowed. Uh, well, sometimes we, we don't watch over important, significant, central things in our lives. We just go on and go on and we're ministering. And the Lord is saying there are some essential things. Because what are you going to do without the axe head? That is essential thing we must watch over it and let's look at you know what, what the lord is telling us about watchfulness while we go it's wonderful to go it's wonderful to be obedient to the lord and say this is what the lord had said i am going i am going to do it and now in the second kings chapter 10 verse 15 verse 16 second kings chapter 10 verse 15 verse 16 and when he was departed this he lighted on jehonadab and the son of Rechab and coming to meet him and his and he saluted him and said to him is thine heart right as my heart is right with thine heart and Je Jonadab, jehonadab eh, answered it is if it be give me thine hand and he gave him uh, his hand and he took him up to him into the into the chariot and he said come with me and see my zeal for the lord so they both uh, they made him uh, ride on in his chariot so they went and if you look at the result of what happened there in verse 28 verse 28 that jehu destroyed bear out of israel 
national victory. The Baal that had been there from the time of Ahab and Jezebel, Jehu came and destroyed everything. He went there in the company of Jehonadab. And, but look at verse 31. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the seas of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Not watching while he went. He did a good work, a great job, but then he was not watching. That's why we're saying that, yes, it's good to have the willingness to go, but then to understand that while you go, you watch over that important thing the Lord has given to us so that you're not victorious or suffering on one side, and then on the other side, you are falling. Watch while you go. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 25. Second Chronicles chapter 25, make sure that you are doing a great work and you are not losing your axe head, you are not losing your conviction, you are not losing the doctrine, you are not losing the very center and the essence of what the Lord has called you to do. In Second Chronicles chapter 25, we are reading from verse 8. Chapter 25, verse 8. But if thou wilt go, wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God has power to help and to cast down. Look at verse 11. And Amaziah strengthened himself and let forth his people and went to the valley of salt and smote the children of Seir 10,000. He went and he had a great victory. The prophet had said, let all those children of Israel go back because the Lord is not with them. And if you still want to go in any case, then you, should, you can go. But remember that the Lord is able to make you fall before the enemy. So he said, I will do the will of God. And he sent them away and he went the way the Lord wanted him to go. And he had a great victory victory but look at verse 14 in verse 14 now it came to pass that after Amaziah had come from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burnt incense to them unto them it was not watching while you go, you must watch. It's not just that I have the willingness to go and I'm going, I'm going here, I'm going there. You have some precious thing that the Lord has given you, the doctrine of the word of God that you are watching over. That you'll not say because just opportunity, just privilege. I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm going there. There's a watchfulness while we go so that the axe head does not fall into the river. And let's look at verse 15. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah and he sent unto him a prophet which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? And it came to pass as he talked with him that the king said unto him, Art thou mage of the king's counsel? Forbear. Why shouldest thou be smitten? Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God has determined to destroy thee. Because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. You see, there are people that go, I have the willingness to go, and they go and go and go and globe trot. They're trotting about all over the all over the place. But then the real thing they had, they've lost all that. All they want now is opportunity. I'm going. Privilege, I'm going. Calling, I'm going. And they call me there, they call me there, they call me there. And they are not watching to keep what they got originally. That's the reason the Lord is yes you must have the willingness to go but you are watching over that accent so that the thing is very firm and it is steadfast and you do not allow it to fall into the river we're looking at judges chapter 8 judges chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 4 judges chapter 8 verse 4 and Gideon came to jordan and passed over he and the 300 men that were with him Faint, yet pursuing them. Faint, yet pursuing them. That's a man of real conviction. A man of great determination. A man that says, I'm going to get this work done. And then, even though he was tired and faint and weary, and yet he kept on going. But then, look at what happened. We must watch. 
It's not enough to say, I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to go anywhere. That willingness to go is very important. His basics is foundational. But then the watchfulness over what we have got, over what you took to the battlefield, make sure that you bring that same thing back from the battlefield. Don't get another thing that is not of God. A false doctrine somewhere. We're looking at verse 21. In verse 21, then Ziba and Zalm- uh, Salmona said, rise thou and fall upon us for as the man is so is his strength that's Gideon even the people recognized that the man was strong and mighty and Gideon arose and slew Ziba and Salmona and took away the ornaments that were on their camels then the men of Israel said unto Gideon rule over rule thou over us both thou and thy son and thy son's son also for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So far, so good. So far, so great. So far, so wonderful. But then look at what followed. And Gideon said unto them, I will desire a request of you, that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings, because they were, who are they? Ishmaelites, and then, and it says, and they answered, we will willingly give them whatever you want. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey, and the weight of the gold of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand, even seven hundred shekels of gold beside ornaments and uh, colors and purple, purple raiment that what that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. And Gideon made an effort thereof, and put it in the city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither, a warring after it, which thing became what? A snare unto Gideon and unto his house watching while we go. It's good to be zealous. It's good to, you know, want to get this done or get that done. But we'll watch while we're going, while we're doing what the Lord has told us to do. And we have that commendable quality of going because he told us to go. Yet you are watching. The willingness is good, but the willingness is not enough. We must watch while we're going. In First Timothy chapter 4 verse 15, First Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 15, meditate upon these things, keep thyself holy to them, that thy profiting may appear unto many. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. We started so many years ago, more than 35 years now, 1973. And what has kept us going is the foundation of this doctrine of the Bible. Taking the Bible the way it is and preaching that word from cover to cover, not subtracting, not adding, not modifying or mutilating the word of God, keeping it as it is. And the Lord is saying, why we're going, why we're now planting churches and we're doing all this and done. And we're here, we're there, we're in this country, we're in that country. It says the word of God still remains the word of God. And we stand upon that word. And it says, take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine, continuing them for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Save thyself and them that hear thee. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 13. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which thou uh, which um, was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. We have this word we're going to keep it. I said we're going to keep it. In first Timothy chapter 6 verse 20 verse 21. First Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 20. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and the uh, oppositions of science forces so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Everybody said, 
Amen. That means we are going to keep the word till the end. The doctrine till the end. That good thing the Lord has committed into our hands will keep to the very end. And do not gamble with the word of God or play with the word of God or kind of, uh, you know, you love somebody so much that the word of God you've had all these years, you can drop that because of this sentimental thing they call love. You want to be careful that you are watchful that the sin the Lord has given you, you do not lose that. I'm looking at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at verse 25. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. But that which ye have already, tell me the rest. You are not there. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. Revelation 2, verse 25. But that which ye have already, tell me now. Hold fast till I come. It's not just that you hold fast for 10 years, for 20 years, for 40 years. There's some people that started well, some denominations. They started well with the word of God as they wanted to expand and enlarge their cause and then make the church more popular and make the church more receptive to the people of the world and make the church acceptable in the sight of all the politicians and the rich people and the great people and all this, you know, we need these people in our church. We cannot just remain at the background like that. We want all these people to come and therefore we need to tone down this and tone down that and tone down that and the Lord said whatsoever you have the things the Lord has given unto us you hold fast until when until I come and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father and I will give him the morning star he that has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches anybody have any Yes, to hear over here. Yes, I do. Praise the Lord. And I pray that the Lord will keep us in this world until the end in Jesus' name. Chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Hold that fast. And as you think about, uh, you know, holding fast on something, it's not just, uh, you know, doctrine of salvation, of restitution, of repentance, of righteousness, of being born again, of sanctification. All that is good. But some people have lost their conscience. They, they do things now that conscience does not matter anymore. They just do whatever it is. Whether they're in the public or the private, they're con- the way we used to regard, no, I cannot do that. That is not of God. I cannot do that. And we think about everything. What does the Lord say? And what is the spirit of the Lord saying? And where the tender conscience that will not allow us to maybe magnify something or modify something or tell a lie, anything that looks like a lie will say, I can't. If you mistakenly said anything that was not right, you run back there immediately. My brother, that thing I told you is not exactly like that. I don't know why I colored it. It should be like this, like this. Some people have lost all that. There's nothing like that anymore deliberately to have their own way and to have what they want to see they just tell you a blatant lie and then they go their way if you take that in and then you act on that you are gone it's like you know you don't know the people you're dealing with but the way we used to have that tender conscience and say everything you say must be on you dot your eye and you cross your t and you just know that this is it some people don't have that you don't want people like that to influence you and say well that is the uh, that's the mark of the day now that's what people do and therefore i do that no daniel will not do that Daniel will not say everybody is doing it. Everybody is saying it like that. Everybody is coloring it. Everybody is being hypocritical. Everybody has thrown away their conscience. Therefore, I'm going to throw away my conscience. If you are the only one that is going to hold on to this until the end, you say, I'll be that one. I don't care what people think about me and where people are gossiping about me. This is the conviction I have and this is what I want to stand on. That thing you have, you want to hold on until it comes and you'll hold on in Jesus. Jesus' name. And you're not going to be intimidated by you know anybody's action, anybody's attitude. Don't you know that you'll be persecuted when people do things that you know pain you? You say, Thank God, Lord. I, I you remind me that is persecution. And you understand that when people do whatever they want to do, that doesn't make you to shake or to say, I cannot stand on the truth again. If you don't stand, if I don't stand, who will stand? 
And if this church deeper life doesn't stand, which church is going to stand? And if we're going some kind of jelly, a jellyfish or whatever they call them amphibian, we cannot stand. There's no backbone anymore. What is the church that is going to stand and say this is what the word of God says? I pray that God will keep this church. That with all this uh, success and all that we're building here, we're building there, we're expanding there, extending there, the thing we had originally, that people knew that man is a man of of integrity. That woman is a woman of integrity. Which shot do you go? Deeper like, ah, no wonder. We know those people when they stand like this, they really stand. I went to you, you see B, um, a week this week before I came. You see B, they have this television, something and all that, radio and all that. And with the person who took me there said, please, pastor, don't expect anything to happen because you know, when you are starting something like this, it's like you are just making the new contact and they want to know you before they commit eat anything to your hand. And before they tell you, come, come over our station and they're reaching millions and millions of people, they want to check up and everything. So, Pastor, please, don't say I'm taking you there and then they're going to give you a platform to preach and platform to do this and that. I said, I understand. And then we got there. The moment we got there, they brought up a, a particular magazine I'd never seen. And I saw my picture there and, you know, what I'd preach on, you know, the Bible and something like that. That's the first thing they gave us. And I looked at the, my friend and he said, these people, they made their research. I didn't know that they know you so much like this. Everything we wanted to say, they just, uh, you know, directed us, said, directed, and we saw their stations and everything, and then they now said that, well, the ball is now in your court. If you want to preach, uh, you know, 60 messages, preach them and bring them to us here. And then my friend asked them, how do you uh, charge here? They said they don't charge anything. That All they want is just to get the gospel out. And where the truth is, they want to give that out to them. And uh, so, before we left, uh, one of them then said, we know your integrity. We've checked you up in and out. And we know that anywhere you see deeper life, some of them have, gone to, have come to Nigeria. And they said, in Nigeria, they see church here, they see church there, they see church there. And people told them that the one church you don't want to joke with is called deeper life. That they'll give up anything if they have to give it up on the basis of standing for the truth. And so, my friend, as we are coming back, he, he was telling me, he said, this is a miracle. That how can they just open the station to you and say, come and do this and come and do that, and you are not going to pay anything, and if you want to just uh, bless their ministry, you just give them whatever you want to give them, that they never do like that to anybody. And he began to say that, you know, they have this conference, this time they have, the, and this all these various nations come, and then they call the preachers, and we didn't even have to say, can you, can you give us an open door? Can we do this? Can we do this? It's because of integrity. And they have looked at that. And if we can keep that integrity, a lot will continue to happen in Jesus' name. And it is not just me. It's, you know, when they came to Nigeria and they checked up this and that, not talking about me. Some people know me already. It's about the church. They said, if a deeper life member tells you this, don't check up. It is like that. If they can say that about the church because of what was done in the past, I believe that they can say that in the future. Because as long as you and I are here and we hold on to this tenaciously and we say what we have from the Lord, we're not going to give up until the Lord comes. It will be so for us in Jesus' name. And the next generation will be as faithful, having integrity, like we, the older people, like we have integrity. We'll come now to point number three. I'm looking at wonders only as we go. Wonders only as we go. I'm sure you know that there's something we call the gifts of the Spirit. I'm sure. Is that right? I said, is that right? And can you, you know, just recollect now the gifts of the Spirit? We have the word of wisdom. We have the word of knowledge. We have the sign of spirit. We have the gift of faith. We have the gift of healing. We have the gift of walking miracles. We have prophecy. We have speaking in tongues, diverse kinds of tongues, and we have interpretation. Nine of them. In the Old Testament, we only had seven. Because in the Old Testament, there was no speaking in tongues, and there was, except Balaam's ass, you understand? Uh, except Balaam says there was no speaking in tongues and there was no interpretation. Out of nine, you don't have two. How many remain? Seven. Let's look at Elisha. Elisha, this man with no limit on his ministry. A man that said, I will go. 
And because of this willingness to go, and because of watching over the things that he had while he waited, let's look at all these gifts of the Spirit and find it in the life of one single man in the Old Testament. This Elisha, because we're talking of wonders only as we go. Let, let's come to chapter 6 of, uh, of Second Kings, chapter 6, Second Kings, and begin to, you know, mark them down. We're looking at verse 6, chapter 6 of Second Kings, we're reading verse 6. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he, he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. That is, the gift of working of miracles. The iron did swim. That's against science. That's against the law of gravity. That's against the normal, natural scene. It was a miracle. Number one, then, the gift of working miracles. Let's read now from verse 8. In verse 8 of this same chapter, and the, and the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants and saying, In such and such a place shall my camp shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once not twice which means more than two times therefore the, the heart of the king of Syria was so troubled for their sin and he called his servants and said unto them will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel and one of his servants said None, my Lord, O King, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, tell us the King of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bed chamber. That's a word of knowledge. He knew everything the king was thinking about, everything he was talking, everything he was saying, even though it was far away. He had, number one, the gift of walking miracles. Number two, the word of knowledge. Let's come to verse 13. And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And he was told, and it was told him, and he said, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he hither the horses and the chariots, and a great, a great um, host, and they came by night, and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, a, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant said, and unto him alas my master what shall we do and he said fear not for they that be with us are more than they that be with them that is a gift of faith nothing to worry about nothing to think about nothing to be intimidated of because they that be with us are more than they that be with them so he had the gift of faith it was secured without any fear let's go on now to verse uh, let me verse 16 to verse 17 and he said fear not for they that be with us are more than they that be with them and elisha prayed and said lord i pray thee open his eyes that he may see and the lord opened Upon the eyes of the young man, and his and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. That's what he saw. That's why he told that young man, Fear not. He had the discerning of spirits, discerning of spirits. He saw the chariots that descend from Syria, but he saw another kind of chariot that human eyes could not see until their eyes were opened. He had the discerning of spirits. I'm reading now from verse 18. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite these people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way. 
where uh, neither is this the city follow me and i will bring you to the man whom ye seek but he led them to samaria and it came to pass when he when they were come into samaria that elisha said lord open the eyes of these men that they may see and the lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold they were in the midst of samaria that's the gift of healing he, he commanded and they were blind and then he, he prayed again and their eyes became open remember what we're looking at elisha had uh, the gift of the word of me of uh, the uh, working of miracles and then he had the word of knowledge and he had faith and now he had the descent of spirits and he had the gift of healing let's look at verse 21 to verse 23 and the king of israel said unto elisha when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and, or with thy bow and with thy bow and set them, set bread and water before them that they be eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he said, sent them away and they went to their master so the bands of syria came no more into the land of israel that's the word of wisdom shall i smite them smite them and elisha said why are you going to smite them prepare food for them let them eat and go back to their master and when they saw that they never came back again that is the word of wisdom right there then there was farming chapter 7 verse 1 verses 1 and 2 then elisha said Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then the Lord, then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God, and said, Behold, if the Lord will make windows in heaven, might this sin be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt shall see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. Verse uh, 16, And the people went out and spoiled the tents of Samaria, or the, of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. That's prophecy. He had, number one, the working of miracles. Number two, the word of knowledge. Number three, the gift of faith. Number four, discerning of spirits. Number five, the gift of healing. Number six, the word of wisdom. Number seven, the word of prophecy. That, that's all you could have in the Old Testament. This was a no limit prophet. And it, the way he became the no limit prophet is beginning with the word, I will go. And remember when Elijah, Elijah put that mantle on him, he said, I'm going now. I just tell my parents that I'm going with you, and he went. And you remember when Elijah was to go from here to here, and Elijah said, stay here, because the Lord has sent me over there, I will not leave you, I'm going with you. It's the going, and the going, and the going that brought this man to the point he became a no limit prophet, and the key is now in your hand. The secret is now with you. That willingness to go and that watchfulness while you are going will bring you to the wonders as you go in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and become a no limit person. A no limit person. What do you want to put limit upon yourself? Upon what you can do? Upon where you can go? Upon the people you can reach? Become a no limit prophet? A no limit person? A no limit preacher? A no limit personality that you just say, Lord, here am I. I surrender my sell to you because I know the thing that will make me a no limit prophet or preacher or pastor is this willingness that whatever you send me to do I will do. Wherever you send me to go, I will go. I will. I must. It must be done. If it's only one person in this place that will be that no limit person here am I, oh Lord, I will be the no limit person. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord, I give myself to you. I surrender myself to you. You must be a person that distinguishes yourself. A person that says here am I. I am going to be who you want me to be. Raise your rising. Lift up your vision. Go beyond where you have been. Don't just be satisfied with where you have been or what you have done or where you have gone. Say oh Lord I'm moving on. 
It is that that makes you to become a no limit preacher, a no limit pastor, a no limit minister, an NLP. You tell the Lord, there must be some things to give up in your life. Friends that you know will always you know be talking to you and then makes you cool and makes you cold, makes you lose your commitment and consecration. The people that come in, they come into your life and then it they make you to you know just just sit back and just just look back and then there's no passion, there's no enthusiasm, there's no excitement, and you just become ordinary. You want to become extraordinary. You want to become a no limit person. And you want to have the willingness to be and to do and to go where God wants you to go. You want to bring back the vision of those younger days. You want to bring back the excitement, the fiery passion of those good old days. You want to recover all those things that you have lost. You want to just be satisfied with who you are, where you are, what you are doing. You want to say, Lord, there is more to this, to this ministry than what I'm seeing. There's more to your calling than what I see. There's more to the power of the Holy Ghost than what I've experienced. There must be a place, there must be a realm, there must be that place where there is no limit. No limit on your ministry. No limit on what you can do. No limit to your power. And you're not easily put down, easily discouraged by so and so, by such and such. You want to be able to sound yourself with a wall of fire. That the people that you know come to make you cool and make you just lose interest, make you ordinary, makes you cold. You want to surround yourself with a wall of fire. That such people will not have an inroad into your life. Those who wear hypocrisy like a garment, you don't want to be influenced by them. Those who color everything they do with a lie. It's become their habit. You don't want to surround yourself with such people. Be like an eagle. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They run, they not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. Do you still pray like you used to pray? Do you still fast like you used to fast? Do you still have revelation like you used to have revelation? Are you still fervent or you used to be fervent? Are you sold out to God like you used to be sold out to God? A man of one book, a man of one goal, a man of one desire, a man of one passion. The Bible says the time was short, and let they who are married be as though they are not married. So, marriage does not come to cool you down, set you back. Lay you on your back. Wife and children become sentimental. Power and passion, fire and flame, excitement, enthusiasm. Life is exciting. Caleb about 85 said, give me this mountain. I'm still as strong as I was 45 years ago. 
Now that now I'm 85, a back pain, my body is weak, my brain is weak, my knees are painful. I cannot stand the way I used to stand. I cannot talk the way I used to talk. I cannot preach the way I used to preach. I don't want to condemn myself. I want to take life easy. Caleb said, no. I'm ready today as I ever was. This mountain, I'll take it. This Bible says in Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. India beckons. I. God did justice to indomitable by Christ. And. From narrow-minded to nurturing milk from Christ. D. From dissolution to a decisive decision. Christ. I. From idleness. To independence through Christ. A. From abject poverty to affluent possessions in Christ. As GCK this November offers you full redemption through Christ. From India to the world, bringing salvation, solution, and liberty through Christ for all. Every yoke it will break. All the shackles it will shatter in Jesus' name. November 23, 228, 2023, 1600 hours GMT daily. Full redemption through Christ for everyone, everywhere. Ministers, church workers, and professionals will gain speed as they will receive the great fundamentals of ministry in three special days, November 24. 27th and 28th. And on Saturday, young people all over the world will be elevated at Impact Academy. It will be the divine creation of heroes from zero. You follow, you go. As I grow, you follow, you grow. As I glow, you follow, you glow in Jesus' name. A life-changing experience awaits you at full redemption through Christ live at gck locations across the globe and live their satellite and all our social media platforms the man of god anointed international evangelist and convener of the gck pastor dr wf kui will minister christ with power along with all the ministers from india this is gck it is the gospel to every creature